Good evening, and welcome to the Ford Hall Forum. My name is Bill Hahn. I serve as a member of the Board of Directors of the Forum, and it's my pleasure this evening to be your moderator, and I have the task of introducing our speaker. It goes without saying that issues of racial equality and incidents of racial violence continue to divide our nation. So in order to, dis to encourage discussion and even debate, about these and other critical topics, the Fort Hall Forum is dedicated to providing an opportunity for the people of Greater Boston to hear the views firsthand of some of the men and women who are shaping the events of our time. Some of the people who are important not only to our community, but to the nation and the world as well. Through the years, we've had the good fortune in some cases well before the curve, as they say, to present such notable civil rights figures as Rosa Parks, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X. We're committed, as you all know, who are regular members of the forum and regular attendees, we're committed to dialogue between the speaker and the audience, and that's going to take place following the initial presentation this evening. We all look forward to that, of course. Finally, uh, we're committed to making our programs available to the community at large by offering these programs, which are open to the public, free of charge. We've been doing this for 86 years now, as a matter of fact. And it's not getting any easier, I can tell you, from a financial standpoint. Rising costs continue to make this tradition of free public debate a greater and greater luxury to be able to afford. It's quite a challenge to keep this tradition going. The forum membership table is right over here to your left, and I hope that following our presentation this evening, you'll stop by and pick up some of our literature, the programs for the rest of this season, which are very exciting. And I hope that some of you may see fit to become a member of the forum, because that entitles you to uh, get, receive our bulletins and know in advance what's going to happen and also to priority seating for these events. Uh, so please do do that if you will. Before we begin, let me just uh, note that the next Ford Hall Forum program will be held this coming Sunday, October 17th at 7 p.m., just as tonight, only at Northeastern University's Blackman Auditorium. Regulars will know just where that is over on the campus of Northeastern University. Joining us on that occasion will be psychotherapist Robin Kasarjan. She will be discussing her fascinating efforts in the emerging area of forgiveness work. She will help us to examine why she believes that learning to forgive and letting go of anger is not only possible but necessary for the deep self-healing and inner peace that so many are seeking these days. Now for tonight's program. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock on Sunday next. Reverend Al Sharpton has earned national and even international recognition as a civil rights activist. As a founder and leader of the National Youth Movement for now 17 years, in fact, he has helped to register thousands of young people to vote and has won hundreds of job opportunities for them. More recently, Reverend Sharpton co-founded the United African Movement in New York to give cultural, social, and academic guidance to blacks, as well as forming the National Action Network, which is a political and social activist organization. With his, what he calls, direct action techniques, he has drawn the nation's attention to the issues of racial violence and racism, and particularly to our criminal justice system. Now, I'm pleased to present our speaker for this evening's Ford Hall Forum program, Reverend Al Sharpton.
Thank you. First, let me uh, express my sincere uh, gratitude to those that invited us here tonight. And I would hope to engage in a very open and honest discussion on the issues of race and the issue of progress in race relations, if there be such. And what I think we can do to make sure we move forward. I think that, first of all, the discussion itself has become too often an unspoken and unsaid uh, and a, a quiet type of issue or subject matter in the country. Unlike in the 60s and even early 70s, we tend to try and brush the questions of race under the rug. And those that have the tenacity or audacity to raise the race question are often attacked and often uh, accused of making trouble rather than solving problems for those in trouble. It seems rather arrogant to me for people that are not victimized by a problem to choose whether or not the problem should be discussed by the victims and then to frame the discussion and frame the uh, areas that it can be discussed to their liking and then say that we've had an honest, open discussion. Fact of the matter is that racism is still alive and well in America, and its expression is very clear to those that merely open their eyes and see it. That does not mean there has not been some levels of progress, but if one sincerely believes in the progress that has made, been made since the 60s, one would then finish the task rather than say, we've made some progress, so let's stop there. If one were to watch a football game, you do not see the quarterback throw the ball, the receiver grab the ball and go two yards and still remain 40 yards from touchdown, and we say, okay, stop the game, we've made some progress. The idea was to score. And my argument is that even though we are slightly ahead of where we started, we are nowhere near the goal line. And the goal line is a society with equal protection under the law and equal opportunities for all American citizens. That is not the case. We still live in a country where there's a disproportionate number of blacks in the military that can defend a country that does not give them the same economic and political options and certainly does not treat it the same way when it comes to the criminal justice system. There are more black young men in jail tonight than in college. That is not because black people are inherently criminal. That is because the criminal justice system has come to grips with being able to imprison and incarcerate young blacks and has not been able to find itself to do the same for other people of other races accused and convicted of the same crimes. USA Today, just a month ago, did a study of drug crimes in this country where they found that four times the amount of blacks accused of the same crimes go to jail at three times a higher rate than whites accused and convicted of the same crimes. Now that cannot be that there is a coincidental thing going on with parole boards and judges. That is systemic racism that must be dealt with. The difficulty of racism today is it is more subtle and institutional than it is blatant and obvious. It was easier when people were blatantly racist to fight racism because it was in your face, it didn't take a lot of thought, it didn't take a lot of commitment. It is much more difficult to fight subtle institutional racism because then you're talking about changing the very tenets of society and changing the inherent structure of our criminal justice system and other things that are unfair and unfairly stacked against people of color. So the civil rights movement or the human rights movement or the black empowerment movement of the 1990s, disadvantage is that we don't have Bull Connor, 
chewing tobacco, spitting it out the side of his mouth with a water hose. We now have a Madison Avenue executive with a gray flannel suit that smiles, but his employment practices and his other practices are just as uh, reactionary as Bull Connor ever was. In fact, in some cases, Bull Connor was nicer because he did have some blacks he was friendly with, and on Madison Avenue, that is not even required as being socially fitting. I think that if one looks at the data of the United States government's own releases, the Department of Labor clearly states the medium income level of black families of four compared to the medium income level of white families of four is a spread of 26% difference. That is the exact same spread it was 30 years ago when we had the original march on Washington. If we look at the fact that in the last decade, the only ones that have lost jobs over a high percentage basis has been the African-American community. That was just relate, released by the Department of Labor. So certainly we have things that we must correct. What happens is that we have the illusionary progressive argument. We put blacks on television, we put blacks faces in high places, and we say that everything is all right. What are you talking about, Sharpton or Jackson or whoever raises the point of racism? We have all these blacks now that you can watch on television. We have uh, Martin on, we have Oprah on, we have whomever on. And the demonstration of access to media gives the illusion to many people that that has changed the condition of the masses of people of color. Just to hire one or two blacks and put them in a prominent position does not affect the bottom mass base of that community. It would be insulting for me to suggest that with any other race or ethnic group in this country, yet people seem to, seem to feel it is so difficult to understand how it is insulting and offensive to suggest that to us. Uh, the illusionary progressive argument says that just because there are uh, more access in certain areas that all of us should be quiet for the success of one or two of us. The fact of the matter is that the movement was not built as a personnel agency to get one or two people hired. It was a mass movement to transform society where it would be open and fair for all and to ask people to be satisfied because of an appointment of one or two people, rather than the opening and fairness of a society at whole is to miss the point that others made when they began fighting for civil rights in the first place. We also hear that racism is no longer a prevalent issue. I argue that even recent weeks show examples of how insensitive that many people that are high regarded in this society have become to the issue of race. Media likes to play upon Ted Dancer and his blackface uh, or depiction at the Friars Club. But what is more important to me than Ted Dancer and his blackface and his, his terrible jokes is an AT&T, not a comedian, an AT&T, a major corporation that has uh, business all over the world, including Africa, that would print not one but two illustrations that project black people as gorillas and as watermelon eaters. I can ignore Ted Dancer, but how do I ignore a major corporation sanctioned by FCC that is trading all over the world that would allow an in-house journal to come with such a racist depiction that was approved by the hierarchy of, his, of, of its department of advertising, of its executive branch, and then they say, oh, we didn't know it would offend black people to depict them as gorillas. So this level of institutional insensitivity is much more insulting than Ted Dancer and Whoopi whooping it up. That is really not my social concern, but it was more of a media attack on Ted and Whoopi than on AT&T, which shows that we are willing to scapegoat a few 
uh, eccentric people, but we're not willing to deal with the very fiber of society that has made the race question uh, still a question that has been unresolved in this country. The fact of the matter is that black facing has become a political habit. Ted Dancer's verbiage reflects some of the politics that we see around this country. What do I mean by that? I mean we take the most exclusive, the most denying, the most race conscious policies and put a black face on it and it is acceptable because one or two black faces go along with it when it is clearly not beneficial to all the citizens of this country. So what has happened is we have a new administration in Washington that promises us the world and delivers us nothing but good speeches and good smiles. We were presented last year with a choice. Bill Clinton, who wanted to rebuild America. Ross Perot, who wanted to pay the deficit. George Bush, who wanted to continue things as usual. We voted for Clinton and we got Perot because all we have seen in the first year of Clinton is him wiggle through a deficit reduction bill, then come back with a promise of a health plan that is not even written, and his urban agenda is a crime bill that would increase police, increase jails, and we still haven't heard one word about Rebuild America. On the way, we see him deny Lonnie Guinea even a hearing in Washington. On the way, on the way, we see Democratic senators saying, let's not risk lives in Somalia, but let's risk them in Bosnia. So one life is more important to us than another life. On the way, we see that the promises made have not been promises kept. But we are supposed to chase Ted Dancer, whose show has already been canceled, rather than raise the political questions to politicians that are there at our expense. The other problem we have is the suggestion of coalition. Coalition politics, in its pure sense, is desirable. But there is a difference between coalition and co-option. If I ask you to sit down at the table and form a coalition, that means your interests and my interests must be respected and must be part of the agenda. But for me to sit at the table, and have to surrender my agenda, have to be silent about my self-interest in order to be part of your coalition, means that I have been co-opted, not coalesced. If it means that I have to apologize for legitimate leaders in my community and distance myself from people that I respect to be part of your coalition, that is not coalition, that is co-option. And many times, Many times the proposed coalitions are nothing but ways of energizing other interests at the elimination of the interests of the African American community. If you want lessons in exclusionary politics, you can find it in some of the progressive movements in this country that represent the interests of every progressive force but people of color out front. And if we have time left, we may talk about some African-American interests, but don't be divisive. It is not divisive to talk about their interests, but it's divisive to talk about the issue of race. Well, we cannot buy into that because the issue of race is an issue that we are forced to deal with. It is not our option. Many people that choose different lifestyles, they have a choice. We have no choice but to deal with the issue of race. It determines what side of town we are born on, what side of town we will grow up on, in, where we will go to school, what type of education we will receive, what type of police security our neighborhood will have, what type of health plan our neighborhood would have, where we will die, and where we will be buried. So we don't have the option of going into some closet or changing our names. We have to deal with race and it is not a question of whether we choose to, it has been imposed upon us by birth. People that deal with this on a fair and square level ought to be commended, but people that feel that raised racism is divisive are people that themselves have serious questions about where they stand on the issue. 
My involvement in fighting racism has been lifelong. I became the youth director of Operation Breadbasket when I was 12 years old. I have been involved in the movement ever since. But the, the particular involvement of the last few years have been around the questions of the criminal justice system. We started fighting high profile in New York when a young man, Michael Griffith, was killed in Howard Beach, where he was chased by a mob to his death because of the color of his skin. We marched in Howard Beach, which was an exclusively white area, and was met by hundreds of whites that came to the barricade screaming racial names, throwing things at us, and demanding we be run out of their neighborhoods. We marched until we were able to force the state of New York for the first time in history to uh, select a special prosecutor in charge of this case. It was the first time a special prosecutor was charged with a racial case in the state. It resulted in three uh, young white males going to jail for that crime. The first time we were successful, and those three men are in jail tonight. We did not march because we wanted to start trouble. We marched because we wanted to end trouble. The racial arrogance of saying to march is troublemaking, like murdering people is not troublemaking. So the trouble was not killing the boy. The trouble was that I had the nerve to march about the boy being killed. So the culprit is not the murderers. The culprit is those that march demanding the murderers be caught. That is an absurd and arrogant and racist position. Then the same happened in Bensonhurst and in other cases. This, this new demonizing of black activism is inherently racist. Any black that stands up for the rights of his people is automatically demonized by the media. You're being divisive. You're being racist. When you are merely fighting for the right for equal protection under the law, like in any other community. There are others that fight, and no one calls them divisive. No one calls them racist. Someone asked me very recently, why do we need black activists? Well, why do we need B'nai B'rith? Why do we need the Italian American Civil Rights League? Why do we need the Polish American Congress? Why is it so unheard of for blacks to want to protect their rights, but there are other groups that protect the rights of other ethnic groups that are never demonized and asked why they're in existence. And they're much more uh, financed, much bigger, and much well, more well-equipped than we are. But we are put on a defensive position for protecting ourselves when others are respectable for protecting themselves. This double standard cannot be tolerated. People respond to what life dishes out. As long as there is racism in this country, there will be those of us that will fight it. And we will not ask permission from others for our right to live. It also seems to me very trivial that one would look at the present conditions of, of our people and start to raise questions of style rather than dealing with the substance of the problem. We have an unemployment rate triple that of whites in this country. We have a, a community that the economy is controlled by outsiders. We have gun, guns distributed all through our community. We have drugs throughout our community, even though we don't control any airlines, any boats, or any trains. Yet, the great commentary of those that study our community is, Al Sharpton's hairdo, or someone else's speech pattern, rather than to deal with the substance of the issue. And they think that I am going to defend how I comb my hair, rather than deal with the inherent racism in this society. It seems real sick to me that people will try and trivialize the pains of a people. And then when we have great gatherings to deal with those issues, they want to tell us who should be there who should be permitted to speak, and then how long those speeches should last. It seems the ultimate example of arrogance that has been revisited upon this, the present American social scene. We have, by law, things that are unfair. There's the federal mandatory sentencing laws that are stacked to continue this drug trade, in my judgment. 
If you are caught with a sweet and low bag size of crack, you have mandated to do several years in jail by federal guidelines. If you are caught with 100 pounds of loose cocaine, you are eligible for probation if you got a good lawyer, which means that those major drug distributors go home and the little horses that carry their mess around our communities go to jail. The results are that you have 25% of young blacks caught in a criminal justice system cycle, while those that are the responsible persons for criminalizing our communities are the ones that are sitting on islands letting lobbyists cut their deals in various legislative halls. That is an inherent failure of our criminal justice system to deal in an equal level. Mandatory sentencing should be changed, and it should be changed immediately. Then we also must deal with the whole criminalization in our communities. I argue that as we fight racism, we must also now fight this new spirit of decadence and violence that has now become an epidemic among a younger generation in our community. Even though I would argue that some of the reasons for it are not inherent in our community, it doesn't matter because if one goes for it, one is just as guilty as those that conned you into it. As I said this afternoon to someone, if I knocked you off your chair, I'm wrong. If we came back here tomorrow night and you were still laying on the ground, you're wrong. So it doesn't matter who knocked us down. It is our responsibility to lift ourselves up. Along those lines, we have began a national drive about this violent situation through the schools that will start tomorrow in New York City, where we will be addressing young blacks on the violent question and telling them to openly expose those young people in our community that are selling drugs in the schools and that are pushing guns because they are enemies of our people and ought to be ridded of our community. We must fight for right, even if it's some of us that are found wrong. And we should not apologize for that because these people have added to the destruction and demise of our community, even though they look like us and act like us and are working for others that have no concern or care for us. It is also strange to me how police departments can police one side of town and are so overwhelmed on other sides of town. Isn't it strange the same police departments that can protect wealthy areas seem at such a loss in poor areas? It would seem to me that if they were just as aggressive, they would be just as effective. Residency laws is something we should advocate all over the country because people tend to protect where they live. People tend to not care if they know they just got to put in a few hours and they're out of the neighborhood. Their children won't grow up in the mess. Their wives doesn't have to walk down the streets. Their mothers don't have to survive. This cycle must be broken by having the people that are indigenous police those areas and letting the residency laws mean if you want to eat from the municipal uh, tax base, then you ought to be part of that municipal tax base. On the uh, national, international level, the arguments are we don't have money. It would be good, Reverend Sharpton, to initiate programs against drugs and training and job opportunity, but we don't have the money. The country is broke. Well, I argue we are not broke. We are ones that have no proper priority on how we dispense funds. The fact of the matter is tonight, $60 billion a year is spent on Korea. We are protecting Korea from Russia because we don't want Russia to come in and support North Korea over South Korea. But if we look, Russia now supports South Korea. So what are we spending $60 billion there for that if we requested any portion of that money in Roxburgh, we're beggars. But those that are former enemies of war, they are recipients of aid. While people that have fought the wars, paid the taxes, and are part of the country are beggars to request any amount of money. We spend billions of dollars a year on a space program chasing Martians across the solar system. 
but we don't have money to train young people in our inner cities. The Martians are not going to invade us. They're not coming out of Jupiter to invade us. I promise you that it will not happen. We need to take some of this money that we're running around the solar system with, take some of this foreign aid money and reinvest in the country and reinvest in the people that have upheld this country. It is a shame. It is a shame, it is beyond words that we play Santa Claus all over the world and Scrooge at home. Anytime American citizens need something, we are special interests. We are draining the economy. When the fact of the matter is that the debt that has been risen, that has, has become the highest deficit in this country's history, happened under 12 years of Reagan and Bush, who did not spend money in urban areas, who did not spend money with entitlement programs. So how can you blame the urban areas for the deficit when it happened under the non-urban administrations of Reagan and Bush? It is absolutely insane to charge to us the bills when we did not enjoy the party. The party was the party was enjoyed by multinational corporations, by huge conglomerates who are now pushing a NAFTA treaty through Congress so they can enjoy cheap and slave wage labor bases in Mexico. That's who drove up the deficit. The mother in Harlem and in Roxbury has been cut in Medicare every year, has been cut in welfare every year. But we drag out a picture of the welfare queen who has been cut rather than deal with the corporate kingpin who's been jetting all over the world getting an increase in American dollars, getting tax abatements, getting write-offs, getting all kind of tax incentives to run the country broke while you penalize poor people who didn't get any of the money. This type of, 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 of faulty and, and of shaky priorities is what has broken the American economy. I argue that we must redirect the investment of this country. Well, we don't need to spend money in the urban areas. If we do not spend them, these cities will turn into bastions of urban warfare, as they already are. We are losing more American youth in the inner cities than we're losing at any of these outposts around the world. The only problem is that it is normal, and we accept it in the inner cities, and we act like it's so outrageous when it is overseas. 362 young blacks were killed by crime among each other in the city of New York this year. That is acceptable, black on black crime. It's no big thing. If blacks had killed 362 whites, we'd have portable electric chairs in New York. If whites had killed 362 blacks, we'd have riots. But it's almost an unspeakable, allowable situation for people to kill each other. And it's the same psychology I referred to earlier in Somalia. Let them die. We'll save real people. That is not acceptable. Well, Reverend, why do we have this cultural uh, uh, violent uprising? Why, why do we have all of this violent nature in young people? Well. I've read the intellectuals' analysis on it. I've read the academicians' opinion on it. But the best opinion I read was my grandmother, when I was a kid, showed me in the Bible that 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 a man sows, that he shall also reap. The fact of the matter is, the reason we have so much violence in our culture is that we plant the seeds of violence in our culture. Children are raised watching television. Before the age of 18, the average child has, has watched 20,000 hours of television. And what do they watch? Channel 2, Murder, She Wrote. Channel 4, Terminator 3. Channel 7, Throw Your Mama Off the Train. So it is no wonder that by the time the child becomes a teenager, that they have become mentally fixed on having a gun and solving their problems in a violent way. The heroes of today are the Arnold Schwarzeneggers and those that can run through buildings and throw bombs and can take out whole police departments. Don't blame it on some rappers that just got started. Deal with gun smoke and have gun will travel all the way to little nice 
benign Angela Lansbury that solves a murder a week to one of the highest viewing audiences in America. We are teaching young people that violence is the answer, and when they come back with what we put in them, we say, what happened to them? We get annoyed at home, and we say, go to your room and watch television, and they do. In two or three years, a hoodlum is coming down the stairs because they did exactly what we told them. They watched the television, and the television said it's better to shoot than think. It's better to get a gun than a book. And until we can turn the culture around to where we make manhood and womanhood not based on force, but based on thought, we will continue to have this deviation. I think that we must revitalize and re-energize the movements of our past. We need to go into the existing groups and make them more energetic and aggressive in dealing with the problems of racism and inequality and unfairness in our society. We've seen recently movements toward that. With uh, with the historic civil rights group bringing in new and younger blood. This is a breath of fresh air as far as I'm concerned. Just recently, we formed a minister's division with the Rainbow, in which I will direct nationally, and I state this for the first time publicly, because I feel we do not need to reinvent the wheel. We need to use the wheels that have already turned and grease them and make them turn more effectively and as effectively as we can. There is nothing wrong with present leadership. The problem has been the opposition to leadership. And the media has tried to play the game of are black leaders ineffective when the problem has not been black leadership. The problem has been white leadership in government that has not recognized the still existing racist problems in this society. So we should not be comparing each other's styles or playing divisive games. We should deal with our allies on an agenda rather than deal with some makeup artist on a style. We must never apologize for fighting back. When we fought controversial cases in New York, all Rodney King in LA, all Roland Adams in London, demonization, attacks, so-called controversy was prices you have to pay. But you've got to be willing to sacrifice even having to explain the young children of yours why people write and talk so badly about you if you believe in what you're doing. We put it on the line in 92. I ran for the U.S. Senate in New York. They told the country we only had 200 fringe followers. Well, I ran. I got 18 percent of the vote. I got 70 percent of the black vote in the state. 200 fringe followers can't vote 170,000 times. The fact of the matter is there is a lot more people that agree than disagree and a lot more people that will move that won't move if we have the courage of our convictions to stand up. There are tremendous sacrifices that have been made. Martin Luther King, Malcolm, and others that set the stage in the 60s lost their lives. We should not, in gratitude to them, come as some silent, hiding apologist rather than those that have inherit, inherited a mantle of dignity and pride because they raised the right issues and they had the courage of their convictions. What I most admire about them is that these people did not have to do what they did. They did it because of their great moral commitment. Dr. King had a PhD from Boston University in this town. He did not have to march. He did not have to give his life. He gave it because he believed in a higher calling than himself. And I think that it is time for this generation of all races to put the call of finishing that mission above their personal ambitions. We have become a generation of individualists who are only concerned about our job, our house, our car, our credit card, and none of that will mean anything when we have our funeral. In fact, in fact, I can tell you as a clergyman that one of the most difficult tasks that a clergyman is asked to render is to preach the funeral of an unproductive person. We are asked to hallucinate for you a life that you did not live and try
and try to soothe your family by trying to con them into some great import on you when they know and we know that your life did not matter. The challenge is, the challenge is to make your life matter. And the only way to make your life matter is you must hook your star to something bigger than you. If all you have lived for is your own material achievements, no one will care but you. Right after your death, we will sell your house and the new owners will never ask who used to live here. We will sell your car, no one will care that it used to be yours. You must build your life around things that will go beyond the degree of breath breathing that you have that will mean something even after death has taken you. The reason why 25 years after Martin Luther King's assassination that they call his name all over the world was not his wardrobe or his car, but because he hooked into a higher principle and he moved humanity closer down the road of progress. The same of many others. And that is the challenge that I give to people of this country is that is that we must look at those that are still locked into ghettos, that are locked out of opportunities, that are locked in unfair criminal justice setups, and we must move toward progressively freeing that bondage. Otherwise, our lives have meant nothing. In the end, history will judge this generation, and it will judge it not by our styles. It will judge it not by our capacity to entertain. It will judge it by, did we continue where history was marching from the generation ahead? Where are the Martin Kings? Where are the Elijah Muhammads? Where are the Malcolms? Where are the Fannie Lou Hamers and the Rosa Parks of this generation? They must not settle for a new dress from a designer rather than a new and aggressive mission from their forefathers. We must take the mantle, and it cannot be given to us cosmetically. It must be earned through struggle. I end by saying that all of our accumulated uh, material possessions and achievements will be meaningless if we do not take that advice. Many of us are impressed with having our degrees now. And certainly this is the most educated generation of Americans in the history of this country, but we have the less to show for it. We have made less progress for those that are down than any generation before us. So what does it matter that we have more degrees in history if we have not learned the lessons of history? What does it matter that we understand the books of sociology better if we have not changed the social conditions under which people live better? We must not get caught up in our titles we must be caught up in the function of those titles. To have a doctorate degree and not be able to make a difference means that you are a paper tiger and you will not survive when the shredder of history comes along. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton, for sharing your views with us here tonight. You know, this is a good illustration of why the Ford Hall Forum is important. So often, our knowledge of a public figure, like Reverend Sharpton, is filtered through somebody else's perception. And tonight, we have the opportunity to find out directly what's on his mind and what his philosophy is on a very important subject. Well, now comes the very special time in the Fort Hall Forum programs when you, our audience, have the opportunity to exchange ideas with our speaker. And I'm sure that a lot of you will want to line up uh, at our microphone here to have some dialogue. You know, it's interesting, um, although Reverend Sharpton is still a very young man, he has been a public figure since his age was in single digits. So he has a long career, and he's done many fascinating things, and tonight we'll have the opportunity to explore some of that with him. I might mention, too, that we are particularly grateful to 
the volunteers for the Fort Hall Forum who are manning the television cameras this evening to make possible the presentation of this program to a much wider audience through the Boston Neighborhood Network. So thanks to them. Now, if you're all ready at the microphone, I just ask you one thing. Please be as succinct in your question as possible so that uh, we can have as much participation as possible within our time and so that we may hear more from our speaker and uh, keep the questions as brief as possible. First question. Uh, Reverend Shopton, uh, as you probably have heard, there are uh, worries that there's going to be a global recession, that uh, America's economy is in bad shape, but of course around the world too. And of course, uh, it's the old thing that back in the 30s, uh, the black people suffered very badly with the Ku Klux Klan and things uh, in a time of economic privation. And since the country as a whole, I would just appreciate your comment on the fact that it looks like things are going to get a lot worse for everybody, including the races, uh, uh, in the next few years. Well, I think that clearly uh, the economy, uh, as you said, the global economy, uh, has a very uh, uh, bleak forecast at this point. And we're going to see an increase in, in famine, an increase in, in resources uh, drying up, and we're going to see a lot of poverty in different areas of the world, which is why I say that the, the priorities now must be redirected toward development and growth and preparing for that rather than having all of this uh, uh, investment in unnecessary non-developmental projects that does nothing but bolster the American ego. And I think that uh, uh, this is our problem. I think that we can prepare for the uh, hard times that is coming better by investing internally. Uh, uh, and there are many uh, leaders that have now come out with those economic proposals uh, from Reverend Jackson's Rebuild America to others uh, uh, that are talking that, uh, that rather than to continue these Star Wars and these, these huge foreign aid projects uh, while we ask uh, people in this country to tighten their belts. What we have really did is say to those in urban areas, tighten your belt when we've been left standing in our underwear. We have no belt to tighten. And uh, we have at the same time been trying to give billions to others who need to be tightening their belt now because we need to bring those resources back into this country. Thank you. Next question, please. You've got a very good memory for certain cases in New York City, high profile cases of blacks being victimized by whites. You cited several. Uh, I cited two. Could you cite two or so, two or three? In fact, you cited three altogether. You cited Rodney King. You cited that wasn't in Bensonhurst, I understand. You cited Howard Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, does your, is your memory good enough to cite some cases of blacks brutalizing whites? Yeah. And along with that, along with that, you mentioned 362 blacks being killed by blacks in New York City this year. Right. And if, if, if 362 whites were killed by blacks, the electric chairs would be working overtime. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have the numbers that you're ready with regards to interracial murders in New York City that you could cite? Well, which may I, disprove I, I your think theory. that there has been uh, recorded by the police department that there has been maybe 10 or 12 that they would consider uh, uh, biased cases. I'm now, not when, speaking of bias, I'm speaking of murders. Well, I'm talking about bias. The cases I cited were bias cases. You, you, you talked that? about the cases that I cited. The cases that I cited were biased cases that were ca called biased cases by law enforcement. Bensonhurst was a biased case, classified and prosecuted as a biased case. Howard Beach, the same. Now, you have had cases where blacks have killed whites, whites have killed blacks, and blacks have killed each other. They were not biased cases. Let's have the numbers. The 362 were not. Well, we're talking we're tonight not. about racism. We're not talking about crime. I did, I'm, not, I'm not. This I'm is not, your problem, Reverend. No, that is not my pro your problem. Your problem is that you don't want to deal with the issue of bias, of, of racism. The fact of the matter is that if a black kills a white, that is just as wrong. The difference is that in many cases, we don't have to march to have blacks locked up if they make a killing. The problem is that when it's the reverse, we, we had a young man came from Utah that was, that was killed in the subways, a white young man. Five Latinos went to jail the next day. The cases I cited, we had to march, 
One time I got stab marching in order to get people arrested. So the difference is not in the killings, the difference is the reaction by the systems to the killings. What are the bias cases of blacks slaughtering whites that you can cite? I just told you. No, I want the names. I said blacks slaughtering whites. Well, sir, first of all, you, 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 I'm not your son, so you don't have to scream at me. We can have a dialogue. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm not here. You're not intimidating me, and, and, and I'm not here to furnish you encyclopedia information. I'm here to, to, to represent what I'm representing. So we can have a mutually respectful dialogue or not. What I've said to you is that there has been less than a dozen of those cases, and all of those cases went to court. What I marched for was the cases that did not go to court. When I marched in Howard Beach and in Bensonhurst, we were marching to make them go get the killers. In, in the cases that you're referring to, and the one I just referred to from Utah, there was no need to march because there was no problem in them making arrests on those cases. Thank you very much for that question. Now let's move on to the next question. Thank you. You mentioned uh, coalition politics, and, um, I guess coercion politics. Uh, were you thinking of a specific instance when you were talking about that? Well, I, 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 I can think of several. Now, I was not thinking of a particular instance. I have seen and, and been party to several situations where there have been forces that call themselves progressive that want to put out their agenda but will not support the interests of blacks and Latinos in the same so-called coalition. And I think that that is uh, not a coalition, that is co-option. I believe that equal respect leads to coalition, not manipulation of agendas. I was not referring to anything specifically because this has been something that has spread throughout a lot of these relationships. Okay, and one other question. You mentioned um, something about tomorrow in New York City, in the schools, you're starting a new program. Yeah. Can you just elaborate on that briefly? Well, we're going to tour the schools uh, in New York and then nationally uh, with a crusade uh, against youth violence, where we're gonna talk to the students, uh, where we're going to uh, ask the students to pledge to turn over to local churches or institutions that sign up the names of any people they see engaged in drug or gun trade in their school. Too often our young people don't have anywhere to go give the information. We need to come into those areas then and challenge those people that we get their name. And that will start at Jefferson High School where there's been two murders in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, Reverend Jackson will be there, Reverend Y.T. Walker will chair it, and I'm going to be the national director of that effort. Thank you. Hi, this question has to do with the state of the black family. Could you elaborate on how, how it's doing? Well, um, I think that obviously there has been a tremendous uh, breakdown. Uh, Newsweek just did an article where seven out of ten black kids are born in a home without a, a male. I think that clearly the breakdown of the black family uh, is no accident. I think that given the general conditions in society, it encourages that breakdown. But at the same time, I don't think that we ought to wait for anyone to do for us what we ought to be doing ourselves. We need to challenge young men to raise the babies they make. We need to challenge family responsibility and family values in our community. There are some things, as I said in my remarks, that I blame on external racism. There are some things I blame on internal irresponsibility. I do not think that we ought to interpret anything or, or internalize any spirit that would not bring a collective family unit in our communities and have men feel that just to plant their seed and not marry or who they planted it in and not raise and water those seeds is anything less than not being a man. That's interesting because that's the first time I've heard you say uh, that. I'd like to hear that more often. I, well, I think if people focus on the other aspects of what you talk about right. versus that, I think that's important that, that it's said. I think it's absolutely important. And I, and I say that as one that grew up in a single parent home, I know the struggles that that uh, can, can, can give one. And I would not have, in my judgment, uh, 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 been able to survive that to the degree that I have had not other men like my pastor and, and like others not mentored me and became a father image for me. So even where we cannot reconcile families, men in the communities need to start mentoring and adopting young men and become examples to them because we should not expect others to do that for us. That is our responsibility. Yes, Thanks a lot. Thank I'm concerned about the genocide of uh, black youth, especially black males. Number one, I'm concern, concerned about the violence, um, AIDS, 
education, unemployment, and in terms of where we are in Boston, how can young people get involved in a, in a basic plan or to link with your program so that we can begin the process to make some positive changes for our youth? Well, we can certainly make our uh, program available to you and, 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 and try to develop some local uh, uh, connection to that. But I think you're absolutely right. I think that what we have done is we've developed a generation that is angry, but they're not doing, they're not challenging that rage and anger toward trying to combat the problem. They're really playing into the problem. Mm -hmm. So to say that, that the, the education system is, 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 is unfair or is genocidical or that the health system is that and, and the drugs and all of that, and I'm so mad I'm going to run right into it and take the drugs and, and, and tear the school down, that is cooperating with your demise rather than building an alternative. So I think that what we must do is have these national hookups where we develop these programs and learn together. Mm -hmm. uh, it will not happen overnight. But it right. must start because it didn't, we didn't get this far gone overnight. Right. It will be a long process back because it was a long process right. to bring it this far. And my far. other question would be, how, how would you, I think when the movement started with Martin Luther King, the first thing that he did was united people. And I think that's a problem. How do we unite to come together? Well, I think... Uh, I mean, in terms of the community, how do we to begin that process? I think that uh, you, uh, using the example you raised of Dr. King, I think Dr. King started when a lady named Rosa Parks decided not to give up her seat. He did not know that that would unite the community. He did what was right. I think if we step out there and do what is right, start challenging these kids, start running these dealers out of our community, and start working with those that effectively do that, the community will unite. To put unity ahead of action doesn't work. Sometimes you have to do the action for people to have something to unite and rally around. Uh, uh, King always talked about the paralysis of analysis. I think we've too long sat back trying to figure out how to come together <laughs> rather than to make a strike in which people can see what to come together around. I'll give you an example. Uh, this summer, we started attacking crack houses in New York. Well, I would go to the crack house and paint a red X and demand the precinct close that uh, crack house. We would go send a kid in to buy crack in front of a news reporter so we knew it was where they were selling crack. Some of them were uh, uh, supposed to be grocery stores, some of them 7-Elevens, and, and we would actually close the store. Everybody in the community rallied around that once we got started. But had we had unity meetings, we'd have been arguing about what to do. We just did something right. and then let the unity come from the action. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us this yeah. evening for the Fort Hall Forum. I'd like to remind all of you, I'd like to remind all of you that our next program is this coming Sunday evening at the Blackman Auditorium at Northeastern University. I hope you'll join us for psychotherapist Robin Kasarjan speaking on her efforts in forgiveness work. Thank you and good night.